Hi, it's the Reading Bug, here to tell you that today's episode is sponsored by Random House Kids and their amazing new middle grade book, The World Ends in April, by Stacey McAnulty. Please help support our sponsor by purchasing this and other fantastic books by Random House Kids at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Hi, reader. And welcome back to Reading Bug Adventures. This week, we have a bonus full story episode of our Arctic adventure, a trip to the top of the earth to see some amazing animals and people that live there. Thanks for listening. Reading Bug Adventures is mixed and mastered by Resonate Recordings and made possible by our sponsors and by listeners just like you. If you haven't already, please take a second to review this podcast. Every positive review really helps. And to learn more about how you can support us, please visit our page at patreon.com slash readingbugadventures. Did you know that the stories and music for our podcast are all original? That's right. They're imagined, written, performed, and produced by the team at The Reading Bug, our independent, family-owned children's bookstore. Learn all about us and shop for millions of books at thereadingbug.com. You can also support The Reading Bug by becoming a Reading Bug Box subscriber or gifting a subscription to every young reader you know. Reading Bug Box is a monthly delivery of books and gifts hand-selected to match the unique age, interests, and reading level of every child. It's a perfectly personalized gift for any newborn, toddlers, or young readers in your life. Subscribe today at readingbugbox.com. Okay, reader, are you ready for another exciting adventure? And what are we waiting for? Let's fly! It's time for a Reading Bug Adventure! It's a Reading Bug Adventure There's lots of fun in store Just inside our book bag There's new places to explore Grab your crayons and paper And your imaginations too The Reading Bug and I can't wait To share our trip with you Hi, reader. I'm so glad you're able to join us for another adventure today. And you got here just in time. Here comes the reading bug flying toward us. I wonder where her magic book bag will be taking us. Each week, we adventure somewhere new, guided there by the books in the book bag. And our imaginations, of course. Hi, reading bug. We're over here. Hello again, Lauren. And hello to you too, reader. I am super excited about our trip today. Are you? Yes, we sure are. But where are we going? Maybe a trip to ancient Rome or a visit to Mars? You're not wearing any special clothing, I see, so we don't have any clues. (laughs) Well, Lauren, your first clue is this. We're not going to ancient Rome or to Mars today. Oh, thanks, reading bug. That sure narrows it down. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. What if I tell you the names of some of the books in my book bag so you can guess where we'll be adventuring? Yes, please. I can hardly wait. Okay, Lauren, reader, see if you can guess where we'll be visiting. In my book bag today are Leon the Raccoon Explores the Arctic by Lucy Pepineau, If You Were a Kid at the Iditarod by Josh Gregory, and North, An Amazing Story of Arctic Migration by Nick Dawson. Hmm. Reader, what do you think? Any idea where we're going? I also brought Race the Wild, Arctic Freeze by Christian Earhart, and Sled Dog School by Terry Lynn Johnson. Arctic freeze. Sounds chilly. Oh, are we taking another trip to Antarctica and the ice fields of the South Pole? Great guess, but no. In fact, our adventure will be the polar opposite of that Antarctic adventure. The opposite? Hmm. Are we going back to Hawaii or another tropical beach then? (laughs) Hardly. No, it's still plenty cold where we're headed. Still can't guess? We're going to the Arctic Circle today, the North Pole of planet Earth. Oh, wow! How cool! And I get it now, Reading Bug. Your books were about the Arctic, not the Antarctic. I guess those are two very different places. Oh, yes, Lauren. On our Antarctic adventure to visit the penguins, we learned that the round Earth has two poles, remember? Antarctica is located at the South Pole, the furthest point south of the equator, And the Arctic is located at the North Pole, the furthest point north. Today, we're going to the North Pole to see the amazing animals that live there. 
many of which are endangered and at risk of becoming extinct. That means, unless we can protect them, they may not exist for very much longer. What a treat to be able to see some of these rare and endangered animals and get to explore the North Pole together. And maybe when we're there, we'll be able to see Santa and his village, too. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get a chance to see Santa today, Lauren. And besides, he's probably very busy working with his elves and getting ready for next Christmas. We wouldn't want to interrupt him, would we? But we may be able to see some reindeer on our trip. Reindeer? Incredible! Reader, did you remember to bring crayons and paper with you so you can draw pictures of the animals we'll be seeing in the Arctic? Just like the artists that illustrate the books that we read, we will draw pictures that help us retell the story once we've returned. And as we travel to the Arctic with the reading bug today, you can decide what parts of our adventure you want to draw. And you can share those pictures with your friends and family. Whatever you choose to draw, I'm sure your illustrations will be incredible. The reading bug also mentioned that there are many endangered species in the Arctic. Those are animals that, due to hunting, environmental changes, or other factors, are increasingly rare and at risk of becoming extinct. If we see any of these endangered animals, it's even more important that we draw pictures of them to show our friends and family at home. At the end of our podcast, I'll play music, and you can draw the pictures that are in your imagination. But of course, you can color anytime you want by pausing our podcast. If you didn't remember paper and crayons, don't worry. Just press pause or have a grown-up do it for you and get them now. The Reading Bug and I will wait for you right here. Okay, everybody ready? I can't wait to get our adventure started. Before we go, though, we'd better make sure our bodies are stretched out and ready for the excitement that awaits us. That's right, Lauren. It's going to be pretty cold where we're going. And there are lots of dangerous animals up there, too, like polar bears, moose, wolves, and more. It's important for us to be all stretched out and warmed up for our trip. Okay, then. Let's all stand up, unless you're buckled into your car, and wiggle our fingers and toes. Are you wiggling? Great! Stretch your arms up high over your head. Perfect. Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, let's get ready to go. Stretch up high, touch the sky, crouch down low and wiggle your toes. Swing your arms from side to side, now we're ready to go. Great job, Reader. Those stretches really helped, didn't they? I feel wonderful, stretched out, and full of energy for our adventure. Me too. So, what are we waiting for? Are you ready for an Arctic adventure together? Yes, yes, yes! Let's go! We're off to the Arctic to see polar bears. In our magical book bag, we'll soon all be there. Say goodbye to our home, where it's warm and it's nice, and get ready for snow, freezing weather, and ice. Look, Raider. The reading bug is opening up her book bag. The book bag is growing bigger and bigger. Soon we'll be able to fit right inside. And look, there are pictures and lights and words swirling all around in there from the amazing books about the Arctic that the reading bug brought with her. I can see a big white polar bear with two polar bear cubs on her back, reindeer with large antlers grazing on barren grounds, an enormous Whales breaching over ocean waves. And I see strange words I've never seen before, like tundra, blubber, inupiat, umiak, and mukluk. There are all kinds of pictures, too. What an incredible assortment of sights. Is everybody ready? Let's quickly zoom thousands of miles north to the top of the world together. On the count of three, jump into the book bag with me. One, two, three... Jump! Let's jump inside our book bag. What will we find there? Imaginations run away. What's in our book bag? Our trusty book bag. What will we learn about today? Oh my! Look what's happening, reader! The lights are flashing, and the pictures and words are circling round and round all around us. We're heading higher and higher and higher way up into the sky. And as we travel, the landscape all around us is changing. 
That's right, reading bug. The green fields and flowering meadows of home are fading, and in their place I see craggy white and brown mountains, tipped with white snow caps. I see icy blue oceans and barren white land with no trees anywhere. We made it! All the way to the top of the world! Right, reading bug? Well, not exactly the very top, Lauren. Unlike the South Pole, which is right in the middle of the continent of Antarctica on land, the North Pole is right in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. So we're not all the way to the top of the world, or else we'd be underwater. But we're pretty close, I think. Let's hop out of the book bag and see where we landed. Oh, wow. Look all around, reader. This isn't at all what I expected. We're on a beach covered in a dark gray sand and lots and lots of gray pebbles and shells. And there's beautiful still water out in front of us that looks like it goes on forever. It's a beautiful sunny day here. And there isn't any snow on the ground under our feet, just the sand and pebbles. Reading bug, are you sure we're in the right place? I expected ice and snow, like we experienced in Antarctica, not this. Oh yes, we're exactly where we should be, Lauren. I can tell. For one thing, it's still pretty cold here, even in the sun. Well, sure, but it's not cold here like Antarctica was. I don't have any gloves on and my fingers are fine. In Antarctica, I was all bundled up and I still got a case of the mumbles from the extreme weather there. True, but look out ahead. There is some ice out there on the water ahead of us. Oh, yes, I see it. The water does look frozen over in some places, but still, in Antarctica, it was frozen almost everywhere. You're right again, Lauren, but I'm still certain we're in the right place. How can you be so sure? Look over there, right there on the beach. I recognize this place from the books I've read about the Arctic. Oh, my, what is that? Look, reader, the reading bug is pointing to a large white arch on the beach to our right, right in the middle of all the pebbles and sand on the shore. The sides of the arch are thin, only about as big around as both of my legs together. But the arch is quite wide and quite tall, coming to a point where the two sides meet at the top. What is it, reading bug? And what's it doing here? Lauren, that arch is made out of whale bones. And I've read about it before. It's on the beach of the Alaska North Slope, the part of Alaska that is located between the two seas of the Arctic Ocean. That's the part of Alaska that's the closest to the North Pole which is just over 1,100 nautical miles further north. No one really knows who put the whale bones here, but the arch is sometimes called the Gateway to the Arctic, a perfect place to start our Arctic adventure today, don't you think? It sure is. Reading bug, reader, let's go take a closer look at the Gateway to the Arctic. Okay. Wow, these whale bones are gigantic. What part of the whale are they from? I read that the arch is made from the jaw bones of a bowhead whale. The jaw bones? Reader, hold my hand and reach out to your side. Even holding hands and stretching our arms out straight, we can't touch the sides of the arch. And look up. This bone must be sticking at least 20 feet up in the air. That's as tall as a giraffe. If these are the jaws of a whale, can you imagine how big the whole whale must have been? Yeah. Bowhead whales are very big. I read that they grow to about 60 feet long. That's about twice as long as a bus. And they can weigh over 160,000 pounds. That's more than 12 times as much as an elephant. And bowhead whales have the largest mouth of any animal in the world, which explains the size of these massive jawbones. Incredible. And look at these other whale bones around the arch, reader. You know, I don't think I'd want to meet a bowhead whale. Something that big would look like a dinosaur or a sea monster if you were to run across one, wouldn't it? Reading bug, what's this boat lying tipped over next to the arch? That's an umiak, a kind of boat used by the Inupiat, or the local Eskimos, to hunt seals and whales. There's a long history in this part of Alaska, going back thousands of years, of hunting whales for food and clothing and other essentials. Can you see the wooden building behind us? That is the Point Barrow Refuge Station, built in 1889, so shipwrecked whalers could find food and lodging until they were rescued. Thankfully, to protect the whales, hunting them is illegal in most of the world now. And the refuge station is now empty. 
but the Inupiat are still permitted to hunt a few each year for food and cultural survival. Brr, I know I said the Arctic wasn't as cold as Antarctica, but I am starting to get the shivers. Do you think maybe we could go inside the refuge station and get warm before continuing our adventure? Great idea, Lauren. I'm getting chilly too. Of the more than 450 species of ladybug found in North America, only 26 live in Alaska. And I am definitely more of a hot yoga ladybug. Let's all head to the refuge station together and see if we can get warm. Look, the further we get from the ocean, the more snow there is on the ground. And the wide open meadow up ahead is completely white with snow. You know, reading bug, if we're hoping to get around here in the Arctic and see all the endangered animals, I think we're going to need different clothes and shoes. It's too cold and too icy for us to explore in the clothes we came here in. Wait, stop! What was that? What was what? Shh, listen! That! Oh yes, I hear it now. Do you read her? But what? Is it? Whatever it is, it's definitely getting closer. But I can't see anything in the open spaces ahead. Reading bug? Reader? I'm not certain. But it sounds like maybe... Wolves! And lots of them! Yes! That's what I thought too. The wild of Alaska is full of lots of dangerous creatures, including wolves. So it definitely could be a pack of wild and hungry wolves heading our way. I'm beginning to think that maybe this visit wasn't a great idea after all. I think we should head back home where it's warm and wolfless, don't you? Reading bug, those wolves are getting closer and closer and closer. We'll need to decide quickly, hop back in the book bag and head home without any adventure or take our chances with the wolf pack. What do you think, reader? They're almost here. I think you need to open up your book bag, reading bug, now! Okay, okay, Lauren, reader, here, I... Hey, wait, look! Look, at what, they're almost... Oh, yeah, look, oh, phew! Oh, it's not a pack of wild wolves after all. It's a person on a sled being pulled along by eight wolves who are all harnessed to the sled. And look, they're headed right this way. Those may be wolves, reader, but as long as they stay hitched to that sled, I don't think they're going to harm us. Hey, hello, hello, over here. Hi, oh wow, are we happy to see you. We just got here a few minutes ago when we were starting to get pretty cold. In fact, we were thinking about heading right back home until we saw you. I'm Lauren, and this is the reading bug and our reader friend, and we're here today on an adventure to see all the animals of the North Pole. Hello, hello, or sometimes, as we say, ee Well then, welcome to the North Slope of Alaska. I don't usually see anyone out this way, and once my team here smelled you, they really wanted to come out and meet you, and I'm glad I let them. Too much time outside in clothes like those, and you'd definitely be in trouble. My name is Tapisa. Hi, Tapisa. It's really nice to meet you, but what are you doing out in the wilderness all alone? I am in Anupiat, and we are native people who live here in the Arctic. In the United States, we are also known as Eskimos. Inupiat don't have a formal greeting, and sometimes other people think that we're a bit rude because we don't say hello or even ihi. But here in the Arctic, we use other indicators to welcome our guests. For example, we smile, we wave, and we love to shake hands. See, Lauren? I knew we were in the right place. I really want to know what you're doing out here by the beach dressed like this. But first things first, let's get you all nice and warm. You're in luck. I've got extra clothes here in my sled pouch. Let me get them for you. Here, first are some gloves and scarves. Put on the gloves and wrap the scarves around your neck quickly to help keep your body warmth in. My grandmother knitted these scarves herself. Oh, they're really soft. Thanks, Tapisa. I'm feeling warmer already. Great, but those are definitely not enough to keep you from getting chilled. We've had pretty warm weather lately. Any other time of the year, you'd never have lasted in the clothes that you're in. But although it's warmer than usual, you'll need to put these coats on too, just like mine. Here, just slip them on over your head, then pull up the hood. Then you'll really start to warm up. 
You're right. This coat is warm and comfortable. But I've never seen any jackets like this one before, have you, reader? It's a dark brown color with a slick and coarse fur all over it. And the jacket covers me all the way down to the top of my knees. The hood is especially warm. It's lined with a soft white fur, and there's pretty decorative stripes on the sleeves and along the bottom. It's also pretty heavy, not like the lightweight jackets I wear when it gets cold at home. But it is really, really warm. Thanks, Tapiza. What kind of coat is this? These coats are made of seal pelts. A new Piet often wears seal pelts to stay warm because the pelt of the seal is more effective than any man-made fabric, even down parkas. Oh, poor seals. No, no, they're not poor. My people have been hunting seals for thousands of years, and the seals help us because they know that without their bodies for food and pelts for clothing and warmth, we could not survive in the cold of the Arctic. In return, we always honor them by thanking the animal spirits with celebrations and ceremonies. You all look wonderful in your new coats. And now that we're all dressed for the Arctic weather, I suggest we get moving. Thanks, Tapisa. The jacket, scarves, and gloves are a huge help, but, uh, how do you suggest we get moving? On my sled, of course. Your sled? With all the wolves attached to it? Uh, thanks, but no thanks. Listen to their yapping. I really don't think those wolves like us very much, except for maybe as a snack. Wolves? <laughs> no, no, no. These are dogs, and this is my dog sled. They make a lot of noise, but they're just good puppies. Much more interested in the chicken and kibble I brought with me than in taking a bite out of you. Dogs? They sure look like wolves to me. Look at their white and gray fur, their blue eyes, their pointy ears, and their sharp teeth. These dogs are Alaskan Huskies, not wolves. Although you're right, there is some resemblance. But the dogs' heads are larger and their fur is much thicker than Alaskan wolves. Inupiat traveled by dog sleds pulled by northern Alaskan dogs like these for hundreds of years. It used to be the only way to get to many parts of Alaska. But after people invented cars and airplanes and snowmobiles, we mostly stopped using dog sleds and they almost became extinct. But about 50 years ago, Alaskans began holding dog sled races again as a way to honor our past. The first Iditarod race was held in 1973 and now dog sled racing is the Alaska state sport. It's my dream to run the Iditarod with my dogs when I'm bigger. You see, only northern bred dogs are allowed to compete in the Iditarod, so our whole team is Alaskan Huskies. Wow! What an amazing goal, Tapiza! And how did you learn to drive a dog sled in the first place? I learned to be a musher from my dad when I was very little, and I've been working hard to get better and better at it ever since. A musher? You mean mush, like in Goodnight Moon, or Goldilocks and the Three Bears? <laughs> No, no, no. A musher is someone who drives a dog sled. Here, come with me and we'll meet the dogs. Learn about my sled and how to drive it and get ready to go. Come on! Quiet down! Rest! Not yet! These dogs love to run, so they start to get really excited when it looks like we're about to go. Shh! I've named all our dogs after cities in Alaska. These dogs here are Anchorage, the largest city in Alaska, and Ketchikan, the oldest city. These dogs are the leaders, the smartest, the fastest, and most experienced dogs on the team. They set the pace for the team and know all the commands, like G to turn right or Ha to turn left. It takes a very special dog to lead the team, and these two are no exception. The swing dogs run behind the lead dog and help to swing the sled around turns. These two swing dogs are named Fairbanks and Sitka, and the two behind them are Barrow and Goldstream. And finally, Badger and Gnome are my wheel dogs, the dogs closest to the sled and the strongest ones on the team. They help to steer and add speed and power. Wow, that's eight dogs pulling you on the sled. That's right, and together they can move fast. The Iditarod teams are twice as big though, 16 dogs for the sled. I need to work my way up before I'm able to take out a team that size, though. Sixteen dogs! Wow! So can these eight dogs even carry all of us together on your sled? Oh, yes! We're not going too far, so my team can easily pull more than 100 pounds per dog, or more than 800 pounds. We won't be going quite as fast as I can go all alone, but it will still be a fun and speedy ride. This here is my sled. 
Look, reader, the Pisa sled looks sort of like a toboggan with two long skis underneath that meet in a point at the front. There's a covered part in the front and a handle just above it. That's right, reading bug. In the past, our sleds, which we called commutique, were made out of strips of wood, or sometimes whalebone, strapped together. But modern sleds like mine are made out of aluminum and a heavy weight plastic. The musher, me, stands here on the footboards of the runners and holds on to the handlebar, like this. Now, this here is the brake. See? I step on it so the teeth dig into the snow and slow or stop the sled. And once the sled is completely stopped, I use the snow hook as a parking brake by stomping it into the snow. The more the dogs pull, the more the snow hook digs in. But to Pisa, there's no steering wheel or anything for you to use. How do you make the sled go in the right direction? That's a great question, Lauren. I can turn the sled using voice commands and my body. When I yell G, the team turns right, and when I yell Ha, they know to turn left. But I also have to lean my body into the turn to make sure the sled turns too. Otherwise, we might tip over. You'll see what I mean once we get going. Here, you can sit on the sled in front of me in the basket. I can use the basket to carry supplies if I'm on an overnight trip. But after I took your coats and scarves, it's empty, and a perfect spot for you. Here, let me unzip it to make some room. There you go. Reader, look. The front of the sled has a spot for us to sit down, just in front of Tapiza. Let's sit. You can sit right in front of me, between my legs. And I'll tuck into your hat. Great. Perfect. Let's get going. We can run out along the ocean, then back towards the tundra, and after that, I'll take you back to see my home. Okay. Once I pull up the ice hook, let's all yell "hike" together to get the dogs to run. Ready? One. Two, three, hike! <laughs> Woohoo! These dogs sure do love to run. You're right. As soon as we yelled, they all started running at once, and now we're zipping across the snow and along the ocean. Look out there, reader! Ice and ocean as far as the eyes can see. Look! The dogs are all kicking up snow and ice into our faces. Don't worry. You'll get used to it. Let's take a left up ahead here, reader. Do you remember which command to use to get the dogs to turn right? That's right. G. On the count of three, we'll say it together, and I'll stick out my foot for balance. Then put both feet on the same runner to bring the sled around the turn. Ready? One, two, three. G. G. Great work. As we go, keep your eyes out for any wildlife. We may see Arctic foxes, reindeer, moose, eagles, or even polar bears. What was that? It startled me. Whoa, whoa! There it is again, Tapisa. What is it? Look out towards the ocean. Do you see the thick ice near the shore and that broken ice floating in the ocean beyond it? Yes, yes, I do. The ice by the shore looks like it's connected to the land. But the ice further out in the ocean is not. There's just pieces of ice floating by themselves. But I don't understand. Did the ice make that noise? Yes, Lauren, it did. In warmer weather, like we've been having recently, the ice begins to melt. And when the ocean ice melts, it breaks up and washes out to sea. Those loud cracks you're hearing are the sounds of the thinning ice breaking apart. Because the pieces of ice are so big, the noise can be very, very loud. Lauren, to Pisa, reader, look! Out on the sea ice is an animal, I think. It's small and white, so it's hard to see against all the white ice. But if you look closely, you can see two black eyes and a nose. What is it? Reading bug, you're right. He's round and white, and he's walking carefully on the sea ice. To Pisa, what kind of animal is that? Oh no! Oh no! What's wrong? I'm afraid that's a polar bear cub, reading bug. And look, the ice around him is beginning to crack. If he can't get himself safely back to land, he's likely to fall through the ice and into the ocean, or to get swept out to sea as the ice separates from land. A polar bear cub? Where is his mother? Can we help him? Unfortunately, it appears that this cub has lost his mother. But I still wouldn't approach any closer than we are already. If the mother is somewhere nearby, she might attack us if we try to help. 
What could have happened to the mama bear? There are several possibilities. Polar bears can only be hunted by native Alaskans, like the Inupiat. But we are required to report any hunting to the Fish and Wildlife Service. This cub might also have gotten separated from her mother in a storm, or if the mother was trying to protect her from an adult male bear. But the most likely scenario is that the mother left her cub because she was in poor condition and unable to care for her. But polar bears are so big and strong. Why would the mother bear be in poor condition? Polar bears are big and strong. In fact, they are the largest land animals in the Arctic. Even though they have no natural enemies, they are at risk of becoming extinct because of climate change. Polar bears depend on sea ice to hunt for food. They hunt all winter, mostly on the sea ice, by grabbing seals who are swimming below the ice and pulling them out for a meal. In the summer, when there is very little sea ice, the polar bears eat very little. Because the Arctic is warming, the sea ice has begun to melt earlier and earlier in the summer, and to freeze later and later in the autumn. This means that polar bears have less time on the sea ice to find the food that they need to survive. Sadly, we are seeing more and more polar bears who are starving during the summer months, and a mother polar bear who cannot feed her cub will often abandon it. What a sad story! Look! I don't think the cub is abandoned after all. There, on the shore. It's a much bigger bear, and she's trying to get onto the ice with the cub. Is that the mommy? It is, but I'm afraid she may be too late. Every time she tries to get out to her cub, the ice beneath her paws begins to crack and she has to retreat back towards the shore. That mama bear is very big. I don't think the ice will hold her. You might be surprised. Female polar bears can grow to almost 800 pounds, but they have lots of practice walking on dangerous ice. A grown polar bear can walk on ice that is too thin to hold a person by balancing their weight across their four paws and sliding slowly and close to the ground across the ice. There's nothing we can do but watch and hope the mama bear can get to her cub. See that tiny bear out there? Without his mama, he's really scared. He's slipping and sliding all around. He needs to get to solid ground. He's on thin She was able to reach her cub on the thin and cracking ice. Now he's climbed onto her back and they're heading back to shore. What a relief. Yes, they're safe now. Even if the mama bear breaks through the ice, she'll be able to swim with her cub to the shore. An amazing rescue. And what a treat to get to witness it. You're right, Tapiza. I'm going to draw a picture of the mama bear's daring rescue so I can remember every detail when we return from our adventure. That's a great idea, Reading Bug. Now that the polar bear cub is safe with his mother, I'm going to pause our adventure for a brief message about today's sponsor. Don't go anywhere. The Reading Bug and I will be right back in just one minute. Today's episode is sponsored by Random House Kids and their amazing new middle grade book, The World Ends in April, by Stacy McAnulty. Oh, Reading Bug, that sounds so intriguing. Lauren, is middle school drama scarier than an asteroid heading for Earth? What? Ringbug, that's a funny question. What would make you ask something like that? Well, 
I'm reading this extraordinary book called The World Ends in April. I can't wait to see what happens next. When Eleanor Dross reads a prediction that an asteroid will strike Earth in April, Eleanor knows that her family will be prepared, but her classmates are a different story. So she starts a super secret end of the world club. You can't really prepare for everything life drops on you, can you? In this book, one way or another, Eleanor's world is about to change. I can't wait to find out what happens with Eleanor and the asteroid. This book is really out of this world. I'm turning the pages almost as quickly as I'm flapping my wings. Well, I'll let you get back to reading then, Reading Bug. The World Ends in April by Stacy McAnulty is perfect for young readers ages 8 to 12 years old. And you can purchase it right now at thereadingbug.com or your local independent bookstore. Thank you to Random House Kids for their support. Oh, good! Reader, you're back! We still have a lot of exploring left to do up here in the Arctic. If you remember in part one of our adventure, the Reading Bugs book bag took us to the northern slope of Alaska, the closest part of the United States to the North Pole. When we arrived, we met our new friend, Tapiza, a native Inupiat. Welcome back, Reader! Tapiza has been kind enough to carry us through the frozen Arctic on her dog sled, pulled by eight beautiful Alaskan huskies, and we just witnessed a mother polar bear rescue her cub off thin and cracking sea ice. It was an incredible rescue that thankfully had a happy ending. And now mom and cub are resting together on the shore. Tapiza, it looks like the mother bear has a large number written in black on her back. What is that? Oh, I know. I read about it in The Polar Bear Scientist by Peter Lorre. Scientists are trying to keep track of the polar bear population, which has been declining due to the effects of global warming on the snow and ice in the Arctic. To do that, they find and capture polar bears, put tags on their ears and numbers on their skin, and then release them back into the wild, where they track their movements and behavior. Sometimes they also paint numbers on the polar bears' backs, which disappear over time as the polar bear sheds fur so they can easily spot the bear when flying overhead in helicopters. That's right. Because polar bears are white, they are camouflaged against the white ice and can sometimes be hard to see without the number on their back. I remember that word, camouflage, from our safari adventure. Camouflage is the way that some animals are able to disguise their appearance to blend in with their surroundings. Many Arctic animals that are brown or gray in the summer turn white in the winter so that they will blend in with the snow and be harder to spot like arctic wolves and foxes. And arctic hares also turn white in the winter. You're going to need to look closely if you want to see more wildlife. But why don't we get going again and see what we can find on our way back to my home? Do you remember what I say to get the sled dogs running again? I sure do. Hike! Reader, let's say it together so the dogs will start running and pulling our sled. Ready? One, two, three. Hike! <laughs> Whee! <laughs> Tapiza, you said we're heading back to your home? Can you tell us more about where you live? Sure. I live in the city of Utkiavik, which also used to be called Barrow. It is the very closest U.S. city to the North Pole, even though we're still more than a thousand miles away from it. The Inupiat people have lived in Utkiavik for hundreds of years. In the old days, we spent most of our time hunting for whales, because whales provide us with almost everything we needed to survive in this freezing Arctic climate. Whale meat for food, skin and bones to make our boats, sleds, houses, and clothes, whale bone for tools and art, and whale fat, which is also called blubber, to keep us warm for soap, candles, and just about everything else you can imagine. Wow, I didn't realize that whale could be used for all that. Yes, it can be, and although whale hunting isn't an essential part of our survival anymore, it is still a part of our history and culture and there are still people living in Utkiavik that use the whales we are allowed to hunt in the way our ancestors did hundreds of years ago. Utkiavik is a small town. Only about 4,000 people live there. Some schools in the United States have that many students, or even more. It's also very cold here. Most of the year, temperatures are below zero degrees Fahrenheit. A few months out of the year, though, the temperature can rise above freezing like they are today although it's still not very warm, as you can tell. Wow, below zero degrees is really, really cold. It is. It's so cold that trees can't even grow here. Our little city is 300 miles from the nearest tree. 
We don't have many restaurants, museums, or other sites to see in our town, and we only have one traffic light. But visitors still make their way around our town to see the wildlife that lives all around us, especially the polar bears. Oh, whoa, whoa! Reader Lauren, reading bug, take a look to our left. We're nearing the harbor, which is a great spot to see some ocean animals. Can you spot anything? Oh, yes, I can! Do you see them too, Reader? There are lots and lots of big, blubbery, gray animals. And they have long tusks sticking out of their mouths. Yes, I see them too. They look like they're sunbathing on the shore. They have wrinkled brown skin and great big flat flippers. And listen, they are snorting and bellowing to one another. Tapiza, what are those animals? They look a little bit like seals. But I've never seen any seal with tusks before. Oh yes, those are walruses, reading bug. Walruses come to the Arctic in the spring to feed on the fish before heading south for the winter. They use those big tusks in many ways to pull themselves out of the water and to break breathing holes into the ice when they're in the ocean below. Just like the polar bears, walrus are struggling with the warming weather and are on the verge of becoming an endangered species. They depend on the sea ice for nursing and raising their calves, and it's disappearing faster and faster. Oh, and look carefully. Do you see some other animals at the harbor with the walruses? Yes, I do. I think I see some seals out on the floating ice in the water. Is that what they are, seals? Yes, very good eyes, Lauren. Those are harp seals. They spend most of their time diving and swimming in the icy waters of the Arctic Ocean. Harp seals are sometimes called saddleback seals because of the dark marking on their back and sides of their gray bodies that looks a bit like a saddle you might put on a horse. Can you see it? The baby seals are born on the sea ice and they are famous for their beautiful snowy white coats. Aha! Another Arctic animal that uses camouflage to blend in with its surroundings, right? That's right! Lots of our wildlife here in northern Alaska live underwater, so we won't be able to see the bowhead, killer and gray whales, or gray tusk narwhal whales in the oceans here today. Narwhal? Like in Narwhal and Jelly by Ben Clanton? The unicorn of the sea? Lauren, reader, narwhal are amazing! They're whales with an enormous horn that sticks right out of the top of their head, like a unicorn. Oh, how I wish we could see one! Sorry, reading bug. Unless you want to go for a very chilly swim, we can't see any narwhal from here. We also can't see the billions and billions of tiny plankton that feed the birds and the sea animals all around them. But let's head toward the tundra now. I'm sure we'll see some wildlife there. Hmm, that's another new word, tundra. What is tundra? Tundra is the cold, treeless area of the Arctic where the lower layer of the soil is permanently frozen. The top layer thaws and can support low-growing mosses, grasses, and small shrubs that feed the reindeer, moose, hares, and other animals that are herbivores. Let's get this sled moving again. Ready? One, two, three, hike! Pisa, your dogs are really fast, and I've never been on a dog sled before, but I think you're an excellent musher. Thanks, reading bug. I absolutely love dog sledding and, like I said before, I dream of competing in the Iditarod dog sled race someday. But I read in If You Were a Kid at the Iditarod by Josh Gregory that the race takes more than eight days to complete and that it's a very, very long ride through cold and snowy rough terrain. That sounds like a really tough race to complete, let alone win. Oh, it is, which is why I want to do it. It's the ultimate test of skill and determination for a musher and her sled dogs. The race is more than 900 miles, and for most of it, you're out in the wilds of Alaska, all on your own. The race starts in Anchorage, Alaska's biggest city, and finishes farther north in Nome. Last year, my dad and I traveled to Nome to see some of the sleds cross the finish line. I still have a lot of training to do, but someday I'll cross that finish line too. What an exciting and ambitious goal, Tapisa. It has to take a lot of skill to get through the cold of Alaska. But how do the dogs travel that far? They must be exhausted. Oh, they are. But there's a lot of strategy to the race, too. You have to decide when to rest and feed yourself and your team and how much gear to take with you. Sometimes, 
The mushers carry one or more of the dogs in the sled with them if they're really too tired to run. Many racers use very different strategies, and many sleds don't finish because their dogs get too tired and can't go any further. And, of course, strategies need to change when the weather changes too. If a storm rolls in, things can get very interesting and dangerous too. It's a really exciting race for all those reasons. It sure sounds like it. Did you know that only two women have ever won the Iditarod? Libby Riddles was the first woman to win in 1985. And then Susan Butcher was the first person to ever win three consecutive races in 1986, 1987, and 1988. They're kind of heroes to me, and I hope to follow their footsteps. A woman hasn't won since Susan's last win, but every year, nearly 30% of the mushers are women, so I'm sure we'll see another one win soon. Whoa, whoa! Lauren, Reader, Reading Bug, look up ahead! Wow! Look, Reader, there must be hundreds of animals in the tundra ahead! All of them are moving together across the snow. They're tall, brownish-gray animals with thick, wide hooves that are stomping slowly over the ice and snow as they move. And every one of them has antlers on the tops of their heads. Some of the antlers are enormous. Look! Tapiza, what kind of animal is that? Those are caribou, or you may also know them as reindeer. Reindeer? Like Rudolph and Prancer and Dancer and Vixen and... <laughs> yes, Lauren. Except these reindeer don't fly. At least not through the air. They do get around, though. A herd like this one can migrate over 50 miles in just one day. And they spend most of the year moving across the tundra, either to find warmer weather, better food, or to avoid predators. And even the female reindeer have antlers, right, Tapiza? That's right, Reading Bug. You sure have studied your Arctic animals. Caribou are the only kind of deer where the females and males both have antlers. They lose their antlers each year, and they grow back even bigger than before. But you can still tell the male and female reindeer apart. Look, for one thing, the males are bigger, and their antlers are bigger too. See? The necks of the adult male caribou are also bigger, and often grayer, and you can see how the skin around their neck hangs down, almost like a beard. And what kind of animals are those, Tapiza? Look there, behind the herd of reindeer, are some gray animals on the hill. Those are gray wolves, following behind the herd of reindeer. They often hang behind looking for younger or weaker reindeer that are unable to keep up, then charge in to separate them from the pack so they can enjoy a tasty reindeer meal. The reindeer are faster than the wolves, but a pack of wolves is much more tricky and clever and can easily outsmart a single reindeer. Wolves are also much faster than we are, even in our sled. So let's stay put for a little while and see if we spot any more Arctic animals. I don't want to catch the attention of the wolves. Sure, Tapiza. Reader, let's hop out of the sled and see what else we can see in the tundra in front of us. Oh, take a look over there. Is that an owl on the ground? Is it hurt? Oh yeah, look reader, it's an owl, not too far away, just to our right. It looks like Harry Potter's owl, Hedwig. That's all white with a few gray feathers on its chest and thick gray feet. And it's just standing there on the ground, looking at us. I thought owls were nocturnal. Nocturnal? That means an animal that sleeps during the day and is awake at night. Very good, reading bug. And you're right, most owls are nocturnal. But snowy owls, like that one, who live in the cold of the Arctic, are active during the day, especially in summertime. They also spend a lot of time on the ground, since there are no trees nearby. And look up! I think that's a bald eagle flying around above us! See? It's got a brown body and a head that is so white it looks bald! I see it! It's flying up high in the sky, like it's looking for something down below on the ground. Its wings are almost completely flat, and they're not moving at all. He looks like he's floating in the air like a kite. How beautiful. I have to flap my wings really hard when I want to fly, but he makes it look really easy. You're right again. That is a bald eagle, the national emblem of the United States of America. And that one looks like he's looking for food. Eagles love to scoop fish out of the rivers, 
or to grab rabbits, squirrels, muskrats, or sometimes foxes from the grass of the tundra. Uh-oh, I think those gray wolves may have spotted us. Let's quickly get back onto the sled and get out of here. I don't want us to give those big bad wolves a chance to get any closer to us. Lauren, reader, quickly back in the basket. Tapeza, look, one of your lead dogs, Ketchikan, seems to have tangled himself in his harness while we were stopped. Should we fix it? I'm afraid there's no time. The gray wolves have definitely seen us. Ketchikan should be okay for a bit while we get out of harm's way. Once we're clear, we can stop and fix his harness. Hurry up, let's go. Okay, Raider, quickly into the basket of Tapeza's sled. Sit right here between my legs. Great. Okay, everyone ready? Hold on tight. I'm going to run the dogs fast for a bit. Ready? Hike! All right, let's go, go, go! Straight ahead! Lauren, reader, reading bug, let's run all the way to Utkiavik and see where I live, okay? I can show you... Ah! Yikes! Oh, no! ah! What was that? Oh no, look! It's Ketchikan! He's escaped his harness and is running free of the sled! And with only one lead dog left, we're veering off to the left. Careful, watch out! Whoa, whoa, everybody stop. Ketchikin, no, stop, come back. We need to go out after him. Here, hop out of the basket and help me set the ice hook. No, no, you have to stay here. We'll bring him back, I promise. Ketchikin, stop, wait. Reader, reading bug, quickly, let's follow to Pisa and see if we can stop Ketchikan. Hurry! Ketchikan! Stop running! Stop! Come back! Come back! He's too fast! Without the weight of the sled and its riders, he's dashing through the snow. We'll never catch up with him on foot. No! Please stop! Whoa, whoa! Ketchikan! Wait, look! I can't believe it, but he stopped! It worked! Up ahead, Ketchikan is finally standing absolutely still. Hurry, let's go get him before he starts to run again. Good dog, good boy. Thank you for stopping, pal. Oh no, wait, don't move. Reader, stop, I think something's wrong. Tapisa, what's going on? We're, we're on thin ice. There must be a river or a lake beneath us, and the ice is thawing in the warming weather. Ketchikan only stopped because he realized he was in danger. And now, so are we. Everyone, stay absolutely still while we figure out what to do. It's okay, boy. We'll figure this out. Reading bug, reader, we're not even moving, and the ice is continuing to crack and creak beneath us. We need to come up with a plan and fast or we're going to end up in the freezing water beneath us. We're on thin ice. We're on thin ice. We're on thin ice. The air is cold, but the ice is thin. This is a battle that we need to win. to the ground and spread our weight across our four paws, or in your case, your hands and feet, and move slowly back to solid ground. Great idea, Reading Bug. Let's all get very close to the ground and spread our arms and legs. Look, Ketchikan is following our lead and shimmying too. Good dog. Shimmy left, shimmy right. I see land within our sight. We're off the Thanks, 
to Mama Polar Bear for showing us what to do. That was a really close call. It sure was. Thank you for your help. Let's get Ketchikin harnessed again and get back home. That sounds like a plan. Reader, let's get back in the basket again and get moving. I'm really eager to put that thin ice and the gray wolves behind us. Okay, on the count of three, and hopefully for the last time today, let's get this team of dogs moving with a big, loud hike. Everybody now. One, two, three. Hike! I'm so sorry to have put you in danger today. The warming weather is changing things all around us, and everyone who lives here in the Arctic, including me, is trying to learn how to adjust to the changes. It's not your fault, Tapisa, and I sure am glad all of us, including Ketchikan, were able to make it back safely. Climatologists who have been tracking the Earth's temperature say that it has increased about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 100 years. That may not sound like much, but the scientists think that this small temperature increase has caused coral reefs in the ocean to die and glaciers to melt. Unless we make changes in the way we live, scientists expect that the climate will warm by even more. You're right, Reading Bug. It's everyone's responsibility to help protect our planet. Look, we're back! Reading Bug, Reader, Lauren. Just up ahead is the city of Utkiavik and my igloo. Igloo? Do you really live in a home made out of ice blocks, Tapisa? <gasps> Amazing! <laughs> no, no, Lauren. Lots of people think that igloos are made out of snow. But in our language, igloo just means home, whether it's made out of snow or brick or wood. In the past, Inupiat made their winter homes out of ice and snow, and their summer homes out of animal skin stretched over a frame made from driftwood and whalebone. But now we live in a house just like you, except that our walls are a lot thicker to keep out the cold. We also build our houses on stilts so they won't melt the permafrost. Permafrost? That's another new word for me. What does it mean? Permafrost is the topmost layer of soil. We call it permafrost because it remains frozen all year. Get it? It's permanently frozen. As you can see, our city isn't all that different from other cities you may have seen, just smaller and colder. Oh my goodness, what's happening? Reading bug, reader, look up at the sky. It's alive with light. Is this an alien invasion? Or maybe a magic spell from Easton and the spelling bee? I've never seen anything like it. There's waves of red, blue, purple, and green streaking through the sky. <laughs> Lauren, this is definitely not an alien invasion. It's what we call the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights. Oh yes, I've read about the Northern Lights. They appear when tiny particles stream out from the sun and hit the Earth's atmosphere. The particles give some of their energy to atoms and molecules of gases in the upper atmosphere. But the atoms and molecules can't hold the energy. They quickly give it off as another kind of energy, the colors of light, that we call the aurora. That's right. Northern lights have lit up the Arctic sky for hundreds and hundreds of years. When our Inupiat ancestors looked into the northern lights, they saw images of their family and friends and animals dancing in the next life. Tonight, I see our Arctic animal friends dancing in the sky. Do you see it too, friends? Oh, yes, I do. I see so many of the animals we saw today. Our beautiful sled dogs, the white polar bears, the gray-brown reindeer, the bald eagle soaring in the sky, the snowy owls perched on the tundra. And I can see ocean friends, too. Walrus, seals, narwhals, and more. I can't wait to get home and draw pictures of these animals dancing in the northern lights. They're incredible. They are. No matter how many times I see them, I'm always amazed. These lights occur most often around the North and South Poles, but no one can predict when. So you are very lucky to see them today. A perfect and beautiful end to an incredible adventure, don't you think? End? I think so, yes. It's been a long day full of incredible adventures, amazing animals, and new friendships. But every adventure must come to an end, and now it's time for us to head back home. To Pisa, we'll remember everything we learned today, and we'll make sure to tell our friends and family about the beautiful sights and endangered wildlife here in the Arctic. Thank you for taking us on such a wonderful adventure. We won't say goodbye, because I hope that we'll see you again. Maybe at the finish line of the Iditarod. Yes, 
I'll be there someday for sure. Lauren, my dogs and I will never forget you, Reader, and the Reading Bug. It was wonderful to have met you and to have the opportunity to share the sights and stories of my home with you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Look, Reader, the Reading Bug is opening her book bag and it's getting bigger and bigger, big enough for us to all fit inside. Okay, are you ready? Let's all flap our wings and fly back home together. Hop three times with me, then into my book bag. Here we go. One hop, two hops, three hops, and we're in. We've had a big adventure within our book bag, and I think we saved the day. We'll see you next time. Goodbye, book bag. Now it's time to fly away. Here we go. Look, reader, we're leaving to Pisa, the city of Ukiavik, and the dog sled and the dogs behind us. Tapiza is waving goodbye as we disappear and begin our magical trip back home. What an amazing adventure. Thanks for taking us to the Arctic today, Reading Bug. It was my pleasure. I'll never forget all the things we saw and learned today. The amazing rescue of the baby polar bear by its mama, Tapiza and her dog sled team, the herd of reindeer. It was all so wonderful. Yes, and the walruses, the seals, the bald eagles were amazing too. I can't decide what my favorite part of today's adventure was. What was yours, Reader? I think the most important thing I learned about today was the impact of rising temperatures on all the incredible animals and people of the Arctic. We can all do our part to help protect the planet by turning lights off when we're not home and walking or riding bicycles instead of driving when possible. That's right, Reading Bug. We had an amazing day today, and I hope when we go back we'll see the polar bears, walruses, and other animals thriving. If you love today's adventure like I did and want to have even more adventures in the Arctic or learn more about the amazing and endangered Arctic animals, you can read any of the books in my book bag. A complete list can be found at thereadingbug.com slash adventures. We're back! As fun as that adventure was, I'm happy to be back in warmer weather. <laughs> You're right, we are back! Thanks for joining us today, Reader, and for all your hard work. If we're going to keep the Arctic animals safe and healthy long into the future, I know I can count on your help because... When you're a reader, you're a leader. You're ready to learn about everything as you grow. You'll show this world that you can be anything. You could write a book or fly a plane. Build a house with a giant crane. Whatever you do, one thing will be true. There's nothing you can't do. You can see it through just by being you. Cause you're a reader, you're a leader. You're ready to learn about everything as you grow. You'll show this world that you can be anything. You could sing your way into a Broadway show. Don't let anyone tell you no. Whatever you do, one thing will be true. There's nothing you can't do. You can make your dreams come true just by being you. Thank you for adventuring with us, reader. That was an incredible trip. I'll play music in just a minute, and the reading bug and I can't wait to see all the amazing things you draw. I'm already looking forward to our next adventure together. Goodbye. Goodbye. We'll see you soon. It's a reading bug adventure. There's lots of fun in store. Just inside our book bag, there's new places to explore. Grab your crayons and paper and your imaginations too. The reading bug and I can't wait to share our trip with you. Today's episode is sponsored by Random House Kids and their amazing new middle grade book, The World Ends in April by Stacey McAnulty. Thank you to Random House Kids for their support, and thank you for joining our adventure today. I'm Lauren Savage, and today's adventure was an original story written by Diane and Brandon Savage. This episode was performed by me, Chloe Savage, and Chesney Everett. Original music was written by me and Ross Gruet, and sound mixing and mastery was by Resonate Recordings. The Reading Bug is a family-owned independent bookstore in California, and we're passionate about educating, entertaining, and engaging children of all ages. 
Learn more about us at thereadingbug.com and our personalized subscription service at readingbugbox.com. And please support passion, expertise, and creativity in children's literature by continuing to shop with us or other local independent booksellers. Thank you. Goodbye.